Hello, Millard students. My name is Ian Passmore, and I am the associate conductor of the Omaha Symphony. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, today about various aspects of conducting, uh, beginning with what most of us conductors spend most of our time doing, which is studying scores. Now, the first thing I'm going to touch on is how to know which voices are most important and what roles the various voices are playing. Um, the first thing you need to know is that in common practice tonal music, we define harmonies from the bottom up. Now, it sounds silly, but you know, one of my one of my very favorite uh, theory professors that I ever had always used to say, uh, "When in doubt, follow the bass." Now. The lowest sounding voice can vary uh, by the instrumentation, the keys of the instruments. In other words, you really need to know your transpositions. Um, there are lots of online resources and charts. If you just Google, you know, instrument transpositions, uh, they can help you with that. Uh, I find that to do this, if you have the time to do it, the most effective way to study is to play or sing the score. Um, all the way through, starting with the lowest sounding voices. Uh, what you will find is that um, if you're playing or singing a particular spot in the score and you have real difficulty with that spot, uh, the chances are the ensemble will have difficulty with that spot too. And, and studying in that way, uh, playing a single part at a time all the way through the piece is a really good way to understand how those uh, parts start to work together. Um, if you have um, good facility uh, with with piano, um, that's actually you know the most effective way to do it because you're able to hear um, uh, multiple sounds at the same time, which is why so many of the sort of old great conductors were pianists, and, and of course many of them still are. Uh, I would add to that, you can know every single detail there is to know about a composer and his or her piece and still not really know how that piece should sound. So you need to have an informed opinion about the things you've been studying. You're not just sort of regurgitating the dry facts of the score. You need to have an opinion about how those things um, how that piece should sound. So I would suggest that you study with a thesaurus. That sounds weird, but for every different musical character you come across, you need to have three to five different emotional descriptors or ways of describing to your ensemble how that music should sound at that particular moment in the piece. If you don't know and if you have difficulty with it, um, I find that it's helpful to start with the happy-sad test and go from there. Is it happy music or is it sad music? Well, it's one or the other usually. Then go down a little bit further. Is it sad or is it kind of a little bit beyond that? It's more aggressive. It's angry. You know, it's, it's something, you know, branch out from happy or sad as far as you can. For those of you that will teach or are teaching, uh, you need to add a step to this. You know, professional musicians, those of us lucky enough to conduct professional musicians, oftentimes we can describe the sound we want and they will use their expertise and their mastery of their instruments to just do it. You know, they'll just make that sound. With students, they don't have this, you know, technical mastery over their instruments. So for every one of those words or for the general sound that you're after, you need to have a concrete technical solution on that instrument that will create that sound. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the roles of the left hand and the right hand um, when it comes to conducting. There's a sort of uh, the, the, the common um, way to explain this is that the left hand is for expression and the right hand keeps the time. Yes and no, that's that's true and sometimes it's not. The decision to use one or both hands can also be dependent upon the dynamics. Um, 
if if something's kind of loud and big, yeah, we may you know want to beat with both hands. If something is small and delicate, we may just want to use very small gestures with one hand. Uh, it can depend on what section is playing and where they're placed within the orchestra. Um, if if I'm conducting a group over to to my right then it wouldn't make sense for me to all of a sudden turn all the way to them and cut off this section of the orchestra from being able to see me just so I can conduct this group with my left hand. So you need to be able to use those hands independently to do different things, whether, um, whether they're both beating or one is beating and one's doing something else or, or not. Um, and that just comes with, with practice and, and experience. Um, <clears throat> Now, the beat patterns and communicating clearly. Uh, one thing you need to remember is that up beats are up and down beats are down. It sounds kind of silly and obvious, but you would be shocked the number of conductors that get this wrong. Now, when I talk about an up beat, up beats should create an actual beat. So I'm going to try to sort of demonstrate this right now, the sort of two different things I'm talking about. When I say an up beat, I mean an actual beat. And there's the down beat. An up beat is not just going up and back down. There needs to be an actual beat, and that is an up beat. And there's the down beat. Does that make I hope that makes sense. Um, and that's why I say upbeats should always come up from an actual beaded point of reference to create a downbeat, and downbeats should always come down. That's no matter who you're conducting, they can be confident in the fact that your upbeats will always be up and your downbeats will always be down. It's sort of like a, a north star of, of conducting. Now, um, there's two different schools of thought when it comes to the beat patterns. There's what I call the traditional school, and then there's a, a school of thought that's referred to as focal point conducting, and they have pros and cons. Um, traditional conducting, if you look at textbooks, um, let's use a four pattern as an example. One would be down, two is over here, three is over here, and four is back where one was. Now, focal point conducting does a sort of a totally different thing. The rebound of the beat will go in the opposite direction of the next beat so that all the beats end up striking in the same place. So I'll show you traditional again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now I'll show you focal point. Now watch, the rebound will go in the opposite direction of the next beat so that all the points end up hitting in the same place. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So, <clears throat> pros and cons. The traditional is a lot easier for, let's say, something complicated is going on or someone's been resting for a very long time or someone gets lost in an ensemble. Traditional, it's easier for people to find their way back, if that makes any sense. Um, that way, if they need to look up and they need to know where the second beat is, they're not just seeing sort of all the beats hitting in the same place. They're seeing one is here, two is over here, three is over here, four is back where one was, or whatever pattern you happen to be in. It's also easier to slow down that way because you're creating more space. And if you want to slow down, you create more space. If you want to speed up, you create less space. So we move on to focal point conducting. Focal point conducting, it's a lot easier to speed up that way because everything is contained in less space because they're all hitting the same mark. So those are the pros and cons. Traditional, easier to find your way back because every beat has its own place. Focal point easier to speed up a group um, because you're you're creating less space and that is really also the trick to speeding up and slowing down right if you want to slow down become a little bit bigger utilize more space you want to speed up 
become smaller, utilize less space. When in doubt, conduct less and or smaller. This forces the ensemble to watch and listen to each other rather than depend on you for all of their sort of musical needs. Now we're going to talk a little bit about cues and I don't know that I have the same sort of thought process behind this. I, I was lucky enough to play for a conductor many years ago who said something I, that's always stuck with me, and that is cues are more for everyone else in the ensemble than for the people that are actually receiving the cue. And what that means is that when you cue, so let's say you cue a solo clarinet or something like that, and a cue needs to show the who and the when, but more importantly, the how. So you need to know how, from your score study, how you want that clarinet solo or that brass section chorale to sound, and the cue, the upbeat for that cue need, and your body language needs to show the how. And I've often found if you're able to show the how something should sound, the, the when um, will be sort of implied within that. Um, now, what I mean by it being for everyone else more than the person receiving the cue, if, if the person or people receiving the cue, they, chances are they know that what they have is an important thing and worthy of you know the conductor going out of their way to cue them. But cues being for everyone else means that when you cue a solo clarinet, everyone else in the orchestra can see you cueing that solo clarinet and you are guiding them toward that being the important thing in that moment or whatever you're cueing. You know, that cue is so everyone else knows that this, what I've just cued, is important. And so you are therefore less important than that thing at that moment. Now, the other thing you need to do is follow through on your cue. You need to listen and react. Don't just give a cue, assume it's going to happen, and let it go. Give the cue. If that is what you were expecting to hear, if that's what you wanted to hear, then smile, encourage that person, let them know that it's good, and move on. If you give your cue and it needs to be slightly more, slightly less, slightly shorter, slightly whatever, you need to immediately process that information and react to it with, with some kind of physical gesture. In this way, you're sort of always conducting the last rehearsal. Let's say you give a cue, and the last time you remember that it wasn't quite short enough. That means your cue, before it comes up this time, needs to show that it needs to be extra short. So you're always conducting whatever you remember the last rehearsal being, because you want it to get better and better and better. <clears throat> now we're going to talk a little bit about rehearsal technique. And one of the best ways to sort of start this is that you need to assume that time is money. And even for those of you the teachers, if musicians aren't being paid, treat it as if you're on, you know, a, a union clock and you want to utilize every second of the rehearsal in, a, in an effective, efficient, and artistically meaningful way. Do not talk about things that could just be conducted better on your end. And, and here's a hint, most things can be conducted better. And better conducting is usually less or smaller conducting, not more or bigger conducting. Remember, you, this goes back to you want the ensemble not to be dependent on you. You want them to be able to watch and listen to each other rather than take everything from you. And it also feeds into what I was saying about cues being for everyone, right? You're guiding. When you cue, you're guiding the, everyone else's eyes and ears toward the person or people that you just gave the cue to. 
Now, for teachers, this usually isn't a problem with professional musicians, but for teachers it often is, or um, for students it often, you know, working with student musicians it becomes a problem that they don't have the experience to know what they should or should not mark in their music. You need to insist um, that your ensemble mark its music, especially for things that are not printed already in the parts. So don't just say something and have your face down in your score, but when you say something, make sure you're making eye contact with people and you can make sure that they're processing and understanding what you're saying and that they're marking it in their part. Excuse me. Now, like I said, rehearsing, at least in my mind, is just guiding the eyes and ears of the ensemble. And so if it helps, I've always thought of an ensemble as sort of a big uh, soundboard. And you as the conductor, you're the sound engineer and you're wanting to sort of get that sound as balanced um, as you can based on the, the aural image you've created for yourself from your score study. Now, I would add to that that some things are better left unrehearsed. You want to leave some room for spontaneity, but that spontaneity has to be clear. You need to do something physical, create, get eye contact, change your body language, use your left hand, some combination of those things to make sure that you have the ensemble's attention and then you can really go for it. If you want to slow down a little bit at the end of a phrase, you want to speed up, you want to take down the dynamic to create a sort of a big crescendo, just anything to heighten the drama, you are more than well within your artistic right to do that. But it needs to be clearly communicated first. You can't just decide you're going to do it and then do it without somehow letting the the ensemble know that, you know, we're about to do something different and here it comes. Now, lastly, as far as rehearsal technique goes, don't be discouraged by a rough dress rehearsal. Um, in my experience, and I think most other people would share this with you too, a rough dress rehearsal, I, and I don't mean a train wreck, I don't mean a disaster, I just mean slightly rough around the edges, it's not, you know, recording ready yet. That kind of thing often makes for a better performance because the, the performers are going to feel the pressure to really bring their A game and they're going to be a little bit on edge and that usually lends itself to a more exciting um, and engaging uh, performance. Now, uh, I'll talk a little bit about your presence on the podium, and this is a little bit of a catch-all thing. It feeds into rehearsal technique. It feeds into several different things. Keep everything you say about the music. It's not personal. Don't make it personal. Uh, music is a, it's a collaborative effort, so be a good colleague and collaborator. Your job is to take what the orchestra or the ensemble, whatever it is, already brings to the table, then bring your own unique artistry to that. And that is what makes every musical experience unique and interesting. But remember, at the same time, you're still the boss. So do not be afraid to stand your ground. Um, it, oftentimes you're going to get this excuse, especially working if, if those of you fortunate enough to work with professionals at some point, which everyone will work with professionals at some point. A big argument you get sometimes, especially if you want to do something that's different to what they're used to is, but that's the way we've always done it. That is an unacceptable excuse and that is reason number one to stand your ground. It's an unacceptable excuse. It's, it's the laziest musical reasoning of all because it isn't a musical reason. It's just not wanting to do something different. So don't be rude, but encourage, you know, encourage the orchestra that, you know, something different is just an opportunity to have a new and different and hopefully more enriching uh, musical experience. Now, these last sort of points I'll make are, are general. They didn't necessarily fit into any of the, of the categories before, or they fit into all of them. Practice your conducting until you don't need to. 
the when I said have a musical character for things before, know what that looks like. If you need to practice in front of a mirror until eventually all of your conducting, more and more of it will start to become second nature. Um, two of the greatest conductors of all time, Carlos Kleiber and Manfred Honeck, um, painstakingly rehearsed all of their conducting in a mirror um, because they were so obsessed, or are so, Honeck still living, uh, so obsessed with how it would come across to the ensemble and they wanted it to be, they wanted their musical intention to be crystal clear. So practice your conducting until slowly but surely you don't need to. Um, I would add to that, those of you that are gonna conduct band, bands tend to play really on top of the beat, which is why it's often easy, easy for a band to get ahead and to rush. Orchestras, play either slightly behind the beat or very behind the beat. Those of you that are going to work with orchestras, the trick is don't wait for them. Let it be behind, which is another way to say let yourself feel like you're slightly ahead of them. If you wait, you wind up in this weird game of they're waiting for you, you're waiting for them, and the only thing that's going to do is make things get slower and slower and slower until there's there's going to be some kind of train wreck. So bands play on the beat. You got to be careful that they don't rush. Orchestras play behind. You got to be careful that they don't drag. That they don't drag. So with an orchestra, you really need to stay um, ahead of them ever so slightly. Watch and listen to recordings done by the great orchestras and great conductors, um, but don't confuse their interpretations with their own. Uh, there's the common expression of saying this is don't listen to one recording 10 times, but rather listen to 10 recordings one time. Uh, the better you get to know a piece, the more you'll start to disagree with other people's performances. It doesn't mean you don't appreciate them or understand them or there's nothing to be gained from them. It just means that they're um, at odds with your own informed ideas, and that's okay. That's actually a good thing. And lastly, I would leave you with conducting, at least in my mind, is just silent rehearsing. You're always trying to do better, especially in the performance, so you're always conducting that last rehearsal, even if you're in the performance. You're constantly trying to improve and and polish and and just create a better um, musical experience for not only yourself and the players, but most importantly for the audience. You know, they're the ones that are that are buying the tickets. They're the ones that are sort of, they're the ones that we're making the music for, right? So anyway, I hope this was helpful and good luck to those of you who are going to pursue conducting in some form or fashion.